will be in verses 1 through 7 once again. But let's read these verses. This is God's infallible and errant and inspired word. Verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, be di being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirits and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Pray with me. Father, this evening, as we look into your word, as Paul said that we that he implores us to walk in a manner worthy, this is the heart of every believer, the cry of obedience, the call to honor you with all that we are, all that we think, and all that we do. Lord, but we also confess that we need you. We need your spirit to work in our minds and in our souls, that you would change us, that within that empowering of your spirit, that we would be able to live this life. Though the calling is a great calling. The calling is one that is centered on the work of your son. So I pray now that you would bless our time together. Do the work that you take joy in doing in your church in the hearts of your people. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. This evening, this would be the second part of last week's sermon, which is titled The Manner of a Worthy Walk. The Manner of a Worthy Walk. Last week, I couldn't finish. Uh, I couldn't finish the first part of this sermon series, which is looking like it was going to be two. It's probably going to turn into four. Although that only means that we're adding one more sermon, um, I, I really believe it's important that we take our time in, in this passage. It, it, as a matter of fact, this passage, all the way through verses 25, they're a primer to what the Christian walk ought to look like. So it's, it's kind of a joy to be able to highlight the virtues that have been given to us by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as I prayed. But before we get back into the text, I want to ask you a question. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but this is something that I've been thinking about lately, um, especially in the climate that we're in right now, in the church. Not, I'm not talking about outside in the world, but in the church itself. And the question is this, what is piety? What is piety? And, and I know you would think to yourself, no one uses that word anymore, Pastor. And I didn't say pie eating, okay? I said piety. <laughs> We don't use the word anymore, and we, if I asked you the question, many people, even in the church, wouldn't be able to define it. And, and if you would be able to define it, you may be even repelled by it. If you are inclined to any sort of church history, your thoughts may go straight to the Puritans. These, these 16th century... I would call radical Christians. But before I even talk about the Puritans, which I don't want to talk too much about them, I, I want you to notice something that it's the definition. If you go straight to the dictionary and you look at the, the definition of piety, this is, this is what they say. This is what I would say Webster's or the Oxford D Dictionary. It's all kind of the same. They say this, and I quote, it says, this is what they say, piety is, uh, quote, reverence for God or devout fulfillment of religious obligations. You know, the first part sounds okay, but 
when you couple it all together, reverence for God and devout fulfillment of religious obligations, it's almost like you take the heart out of it. It becomes this idea of, of piety becomes heartless as a, a, a motivation that is not based in any true love of God. And, and you'll remember that. I'm going to get to that portion, what, how we really should be defining piety. So in, in real life experience, this, this piety has already been happening to you, believer. This has already been happening to you. As a matter of fact, it's already been happening to you since we've been going through the study of the book of Ephesians. If you are born again, if you sit in that seat now, you're born again, you're a true believer in the gospel, this piety has already been happening to you. I, I want to give you a definition from someone that I truly respect that gives a way better definition of what true piety is. And it's, it's John Calvin. And he defines piety this way, and he has a few parts to it. I'm going to read not the whole quote, but I want to give you in pieces what he says. Number one, he says this, piety is a, a right attitude of self toward God. A right attitude toward self, an attitude of self toward God. The second definition he gives this, that's coupled together, it keeps on going down like a chain, says a sound or true knowledge of God. The next one is a heartfelt worship of God. This fourth one is, is fairly easy. He defines it this way, saving faith. The next one is filial fear. Let me rephrase so you don't know. Filial means like family. So think family. So familial or filial fear. Meaning this is that you see your God as your father now and you have this familial fear. The next one is prayerful submission. And the last one, which undergirds the whole thing, reverential love. Let me read them all together just so you see the, the line of thought here. Piety is the right attitude of self towards God, coupled with sound or true knowledge of God and doctrine and theology, a heartfelt worship that comes from that knowledge, a saving faith that is applied to that particular knowledge of God, a familial fear that you have now because you have this relationship as God and your Father, a prayer for submission, knowing that you are dependent upon this God for everything, and because of all these things, you have a reverential love, devotion to this God. I love that. In short, he calls piety, and I quote, he says this, quote, reverence joined with love of God, which the knowledge of with the knowledge of his benefits and which in the knowledge of his benefits induces. Let me tell you something. If you haven't been here, again, I keep repeating myself. If you haven't been here for Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, go back because this that would be the fuel to understand what piety is, how it actually gives you wind in your sails, fuel to your, your lack of, of, of obedience because of what he just said, the knowledge of which his benefits induces. What has God done? And then what does this sort of understanding produce? I'll tell you this, it produces, if you're a believer, a whole life that practices holy living, righteous living, godliness, a God-honoring life. Calvin says that this pious man or woman confesses this. Quote, we are gods. We belong to him. Let us therefore live for him and die for him. We are gods. We belong to him. Let, us, let, us, let his wisdom and will therefore rule all of our actions. We are gods. 
let us all let all the parts of our life accordingly strive towards him as our only lawful goal. Piety is the beginning, the middle, and the end of your Christian life. Where does this start? Where does this obedience, where does this piety, this pious living begin? It, it begins, I'll tell you this, in an obedience to God's word. So every time we, we look into God's word, as we're going to do tonight, we have the opportunity for change. We have an opportunity to define things like this. So why, why am I defining piety? Why, even, why am I even talking about this? Well, I'll take you back to verse 1 to explain that. Not to re-preach the whole message. We're going to do some review now. But Paul says, as he opens this section, he says, I implore you. I implore you. Look at it. It says, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. Imploring. The Greek word parakaleo, to beseech, is, is, is a simple definition. But to get a deeper, deeper understanding, if you remember from last week, I took you to Luke chapter 8 and verse 41. And you remember the story kind of playing into this portion is in Luke 8, there's this, this official of the synagogue. So he has some status and he, he falls to Jesus' feet. And it says, he implored Jesus. Falling at his feet, he implored him. He, he begs the Lord Jesus to heal his 12-year-old daughter that is close to death, death and actually dies. So, so think about that word. In the context to our passage, I implore you, it sounds, if you just read it that way, it sounds like just a suggestion. But that's not how this man used this word. A begging, a beseeching. It, it's much like Romans 12.1, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God. In the same way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord how you ought to walk and please God. This is stronger than just a suggestion. This is not... This is not even a suggestion, actually. The appeal is to, is to change behavior with this foundation found where? In true piety. Heartfelt piety. Love for God fueled piety. A calling. What first in the past out of darkness into a, a communion and a union with Christ himself. Remember in chapter 2, look at chapter 2 and verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. You're united to Christ. Verse 10, same chapter. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Same wording. Walk in a manner worthy. This is God's calling. Out of darkness, into light, into union with Christ. This is our motivation to unity. This is our motivation to unity. It's the greatest motivation to unity. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Still by way of introduction. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 10. It says, now I exhort you, here's this, this request, this beseeching again, right? Brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree 
and that there is there be no divisions among you, but that you may be able to complete in the same be complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. This is a call to maturity. So what does this look like? What does this call to piety look like? What what character traits does this have? I take you back to chapter four, and we're going to do a quick review. So the first one he said, look at chapter chapter four, verse two, it says, with all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. So our first virtue that he says, you've been empowered to, to actually act upon this is humility. The, the rejection of any sort of pride and the embracing of a lowly attitude. For what? To raise others up. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6. I was thinking through this literally probably the whole week. Just meditating on 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 a major the major sin i think that a lot of times it's actually overlooked in the church's pride and it's 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 sometimes it just reflects itself as internal so it's hard to see unless someone reflects it someone actually starts acting upon that pride so when 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 it does come out it's it's one of the ugliest sins you'll ever see as a matter of fact, I think pride gives birth to most other sins. But, but look at what, what God's word has to say. Proverbs 6, verse 16. You might be familiar with this. This is the first thing I thought of when I thought about pride. This, verse 16, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. So let me, let me just set something for you. He doesn't say that it's it, the hate is just a mere like dislike. Like this is just a mere annoyance to God. Because if that would be true, he wouldn't use the next word, an abomination. That, that's a heavy word. The abomination carries the, the, the connotation of damnation. It even sounds the same. And he says this, just verse 17, first two words, haughty eyes. Again, this is difficult for us because, what? Well, you don't use that, right? You don't go to a sister or brother and say, hey, why do you have haughty eyes? What's wrong with you? But th- this, is, this is something that God says that he hates and it's an abomination. So what is it? it it's the idea of this. And the Hebrew would kind of have this idea. Is you look in the mirror and you think, man, I like what I see. You know what? I'm something else. I'm a catch. I don't understand why no one could get along with me. Look at me. Haughty eyes. That it's it's the definition is uh it's funny. It's an exalted view. It's um you know when they you know the connotation in in the in um or the euphemism in English would be the the you turn your nose up to people. You you look down upon people. So when you do that and you go, hmm. You know, I, I see this sometimes. Sorry, ladies, I'm going to call you out a little bit. Um, but the ladies will do this. Like a lady's coming up and they do this. You look a girl up and down. The way her shoes to her dress to her blouse. It, it's that idea. It's like, why are you doing that? Maybe you're admiring her clothes, but maybe you're actually in your heart. You're like, oh, wow. You know, this exalted view of self. And God says, I hate this. I, I don't just think to myself, it, it, think about this. If he hates it in the world, and he does, and he thinks it's an abomination worthy of damnation, if he hates it in the world, do you think that he hates it in his own people that he loves? I think he would look upon the church and say, why would you even operate in this fashion and then it goes on in in proverbs because this type of haughty spirit gives birth to other things the next one a lying tongue 
hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife. Listen, listen to what he says next. This is a problem in the church. The one that spreads strife among the public? That's not what it says. Brothers. Family. Are we not family? And we look at this and we make excuses for it. Look, turn, turn to Psalm 101. I want to show you another portion of Scripture fairly quickly. Just one verse. Psalm 101. In verse 5, it says this, Whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. This is, how, this is how serious he takes these things, right, the Lord? And no one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. I won't put up with them. What does God say? God, I resist the proud. That's, this is serious. Look at Philippians. Go to all the way to Philippians chapter 2. Chapter 2, look at verse 3. It says this. I, I kind of gave this last week, but I want, I want us to take a look at it again because we've got to get a running start into this portion of Scripture. It says, Make my joy complete by having the same mind, maintaining the same love, United in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now, now, how is this done? How is this done? Verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, make, taking the form of a bondservant, a slave, and being made in the likeness of men. You know, I, I see this a lot. It, it's the view of self. It, it's if it's if it's not lowered. I'm gonna tell you, you already have a high view of yourself. If it's not lowered, there's a danger that you alienate everyone around you. You know, I see this a lot when I when I'm in conversation with people, and 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 some people are like, um, I don't know if you've seen this before, where it seems as though someone is like a bull in a cage. They're not really listening to what you're saying. They're just ready to, to just interrupt you and to say whatever they need to say because they only value what they have to say. They love the sound of their own voice to the point that they're not even following the conversation. Again, they're willing to interrupt you. That type of person thinks so highly of themselves. Pride is at the heart of these things. You're not willing to take correction. It's we need to practice humility. I think humility, listen, I don't think this, I know this. Humility has to be the greatest virtue in the church. Because none of us here have reason to be prideful. Because if I asked any of you here that are believers in that, and I said, I asked you one question, do you think you deserved salvation? And every one of you would say, no, I do not. I don't even deserve it now. That, that should cause a sense of humility. That the God of the universe would send his son to become flesh and die. And it takes us even to the next one, gentleness. Turn back to Ephesians 4. He says, with all humility and gentleness. Meekness, it could be defined. The definition, I love this. Think about this definition, just so you know. In the context of what it, how it's actually telling us, is, it says this. It's being careful with people. Gentleness, being careful with people. Being careful with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Having a loving care for them. And I gave a few verses from... From last time, and I, I can't read them, but again, I'm going to give you the citations. And it talks about gentleness, and the, the scriptures talk about gentleness in, in various forms. But these are some of, 
I think the most beautiful attitudes to have within the church, especially gentleness, but in the context of some of these things, it says, number one, it says, correcting someone in love, Galatians 6, 1. Correcting someone in love and gentleness. The second one is receiving believers different than you in gentleness. Colossians 3, 12 and 14. 12 through 14. That's a big one, right? We have multi, we're, we don't pride ourselves in this. We're multicultural church, right? But ask me if I care. I don't care. We have one culture in this church. There's one culture. We're one body in Jesus Christ. So the culture is almost irrelevant until potluck show comes around, right? Then I don't mind culture then. The next one is correcting false, correcting false understanding or false teaching in gentleness, 2 Timothy 2.25. Demonstrating gentle wisdom, James 3.13. Or defending the faith in gentleness, 1 Peter 3.15. Gentleness is, is wisdom and spiritual strength under holy under a holy self-control for the benefits of others. The next one was patience. With all humility and gentleness, with patience. And this, this definition of patience is steadfastness, endurance, slow to anger, Holding fast to loving, uh, a loving, long-suffering. Remembering what? That the Lord was patient with you, was he not? As a matter of fact, is he still patient with you even now? And it's, it goes into the next one. It couples it very nicely. Patience showing tolerance. Tolerance enduring, bearing with one another. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 puts it, beautifully when it talks that chapter about love and it says bearing all things bearing all things believing all things hoping all things enduring all things you know I, I love that because sometimes we would say well at what point do do i stop being patient and tolerant well first corinthians thirteen seven says that you bear some things all things that you believe some things no you believe all things do you hope in some things? No, you hope in all things. Do you assume the best of your brother and sister? You do that. Why? Because this is what true tolerance is. It's not tolerance of sin. Do you understand that? That's not what it's saying. It's tolerance for the sake of unity. Do you know that not everything has to be an issue? I think a lot of things, and in, in, I'll tell you this, in church planting, one of the major things I've learned is this, is that the, the sheep think that everything is an issue. And instead of us enduring with each other and having patience and having tolerance, we want to address everything. Everything. If, if, it, if it's not covered in, in, in a bearing, loving understanding of Christ, what Christ has done, then what, where, where are your thoughts going? It says it, Colossians 3, 13. Let me read this to you. And, and think about what it's telling us. It says, bearing with one another, or tolerating in it one another, being patient with one another, it could be translated in any of those ways, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone... Take it to the pastor. Did it say that? No. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so you also should forgive. You know, there, there's always this, um, the theology of, of forgiveness. As people have told me in the past, like, do I, do I, should I forgive I'm going to tell you right now, the shortcut within the church is you must forgive in the church. Forgiving people, forgive people, right? Write it down. Forgiving people, forgive people. 
It's really not that difficult. It, it isn't that hard. The, the only thing is that we want, we, we're kind of those people that want to find, um, like there's a clause there. There must be an addendum. Let me go to the back of my Bible. Is there an amendment? No. You must forgive. Why? It takes us right next to the, to the next one. In, in Ephesians 4, look what it says. Showing tolerance for one another in love. Everything must be filtered through love. And, and not some random type of love. But, but the love that we've received from God. That it produces a love for God first. And then, and then further produces a love for ch- the church. For your brothers and sisters. 1 John 4.19 says we love because he first loved us. That's still in my Bible. This is, literally, this is literally how, how loving the people that are hard to love becomes easy. It becomes easy. Because your love for them is not based in them. Do you realize that? Like how do you love the unlovable? Well, that love is not based in them. And, and, and for a matter of fact, it's not even based in you. It doesn't have its foundation in you. First John 4, 19, again, we love because he first loved us. So as a matter of fact, is this, is that if you're a believer, you're the only people in the population of this world that have experienced real love. True love. A love that has no ends. It has no bottom. It has no height. So how should your love be? It should be exactly the same. It should have no ends. It should have no bounds. Again, chapter 3, we've been united together. United to God and then united to each other. In one body. And this is where we left off last week. Let me take you to the next verse. Verse 3. We get into now. We have a bunch of nouns now. In, verse, in verses 2. And now we're going to get into some verbs. Now it's going to call you to. You know what? It's call you to action. It, it's this. It's like I feel sorry for you guys right now. Because you know too much. And you're about to learn way more then you might not want to hear. But I'll tell you this, the church needs to hear this. Paul sent this to the Ephesians because they needed to hear it. He sent this to the, the, the greater area of Asia Minor because all the churches in Asia Minor needed to understand this. And guess who needs to know this? I need to know this. And you need to know this. So he goes right into verse 3. Look at what he says next. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So our first verb is diligent. And the way it's written, it's written in a a present active participle. This is the grammar of what we're seeing right now. And what it it means is this, is that it carries an urgency and a timing to what what is being asked of you. It means this, proceed Quickly, hasten, take pains to do this. Be zealous and eager to do this. It carries more than just a simple idea of saying, you know what, I I need you to be diligent. You know, you've gotten that at work before, right? If you're ever corrected, I need you to be diligent in this area. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I need you to be urgent about this. And And when do we need you to do it? I need you to do it now. Do this now. Do this often. Because why? Because it's vitally important. Because the life of the church depends on it. It's unity. It's love. It's harmony. Depends on this diligence. Listen. 
This is a church-wide activity. It, it's not as like you get like, well, you know what, well, I'm a part of this ministry or that ministry. I don't serve in that ministry. I'm not in the diligence ministry, okay? Or you know what, I don't serve in the diligence ministry until like five weeks from now. All of you are in the diligence ministry. Welcome to the ministry. <laughs> This is, again, a church-wide activity. We're, look, at, we're not spectators. You understand this, right? I've said this before. If you haven't heard me say this, church is not a spectator sport. You understand? I'll put it this way. When you come to church and you worship God, as you're doing now also, this is worship. It's not just the singing. This is worship also. You're not here as a consumer. You're not here to say, well, let me wait into, until Pastor Ulysses does a decent job in the sermon and I might give an offering. You have the wrong idea about church. You are not consumers. You understand? There's one consumer. There's one consumer in our midst right now, and it's God. Consuming your worship. Consuming your worship in song. Consuming your worship in, in diligence. In study right now, as you are listening to the sermon, there's one consumer. And when you leave from here, you don't begin to, to say to yourself, well, now that I consume this, no. No. Paul says about the gospel, listen to this. I am a debtor to all men. I've been given this to me. This, this is, is big given to me. I need to give it away. So you, you're here and you sit here before, before the preaching of God's word. He says, you need to be diligent in this. You're not a consumer. You're filled to be emptied. And you get out of this area and you pour your life into the person next to you and the person behind you and the person in front of you. To be diligent in, in preserving unity. Paul uses this word when he's talking to Timothy. Look at, let's look at it. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You guys remember this portion of scripture. But I want you to see it for yourself to kind of get this idea of, of what it looks like to be diligent. He uses the same exact word. And he says this in verse 15. Chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy. He says, Timothy, listen, Timothy, be diligent to present yourself or prove to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately dividing or handling the word of truth. You know, reread that. And you know what we like to do? This is, I know you like to do this because when I read this before, you know, the Lord showed me or taught me how to interpret these portions of scripture. I would see it and say, yeah, primarily this is talking about personal Bible study. Or as a pastor, because of a pastoral epistle, then he's saying, as a pastor, you need to be diligent in this area because you need to go and teach this. No, listen. It is that, but it is not primarily that. Because look at verse 16. It says, don't, it says do this and don't do this. By the conjunction, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. Timothy, Timothy, I need you to be diligent to present yourself as a workman, to study God's word, to divide it rightly, to, to dig for treasure, then you find it. And what does it do? What does it do? Verse 16, it creates piety. Godliness, holiness. It combats worldly speech. It combats worldly ideas. It combats ungodly character. That's why you study the Bible. You realize that, right? This is what he's telling him. Timothy, keep watch over yourself and your doctrine 
It's always coupled together. He tells us the same thing. Our diligence is to have an enthusiasm to it. John MacArthur calls it a holy zeal. And, and then what does he say next? Turn back to Ephesians 4. He says, be diligent to preserve the unity. He, he uses his word now, preservation. Another verb. And another and in, in the grammar that it's written, again, it, it, there's an urgency. It says, it's a, present, it's a present active infinitive. What does that mean? This means that it's to be consistent. It has no expiration. It is the business of the church of everyday life. The, the, the unity, listen, the unity is formed by God through the gospel. And, and then we're unified into this one body of believers that this body of believers is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We didn't do any of that. We didn't, we didn't do any of that, that unification. We didn't, we didn't bring that to pass. It was God. But now this, in, this unity that we enjoy, we have to understand that it's a precious and fragile gift. And, and this precious and fragile gift is, is easily fractured. Like I said earlier, we, the church, we did not, in our own wisdom, create this unity. This unity belongs in the Spirit of God. Yet, every member of Christ's church is responsible to, through a faithful walk, in a, in a, in a walk that is worthy of this calling to live a life that God could say, you know what? You were diligent. You did preserve these things. We do this collectively, don't we? We do this collectively and we do this individually. We put God's, this is the beauty of it, we put God's gospel his work within the church, we put it on display when, when we actively work in this fashion. And then it says, look in chapter 3. It says that being a part of this church, it's, it's the church is God's glory. Look at chapter 3, look at verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all all that we ask or think, according to, look at what it says, according to the power that works within us. To him be glory. And, and then he says this, look at this little phrase. And you won't find it anywhere else. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 10, same chapter. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known, where? Through the church. Through the church. The church is God's glory. It, it puts on display his, his glorious, redemptive work. You know, I, I think to myself this sometimes. I ask people sometimes, and sometimes just people just tell me, you know, they ask me, well, what's so different of, about Grace Community Church South Bay? And, and, and maybe they offer their opinion, and maybe sometimes I ask it. I ask, like, what did you think? How did you enjoy your time if you're visiting? And, and the one major thing I always get is this. The people here love God, and they love each other. And then you get this other idea that they say, it felt like I'm, I, get, I got swallowed up. And, and in my thinking, I, I, I go to see, this is outsiders, what they say, and then I go and look and see what you say about your own church. 
And, and what I've seen is that you say things like the preaching, the exposition. God's word is at the forefront of this church. And, and it's, it isn't like I'm taking a step back and thinking, oh, wow, look at me. I think to myself this. The word of God is taking root in the hearts of our people here. Outsiders see the work, and that's how they demonstrate it. That's how they vocalize it. And then when I ask the, the people here, they say, but that happened because of this, because of this book. Because of this, that spirit that works in me through the preaching of God's word. That's a testament. Because, again, if people ask, I say, you know what? We're not unique. We're not. Sorry to tell you, but we're not unique. You know what we are? We're biblical. When you see the Church of Acts, that's how the Church of Acts, that's how they preserved unity. They loved each other. They applied the Word of God together. This is why we have home groups. It's the whole reason. So when we get to this last portion, Ephesians 4, listen, when we get to this last portion of what it says, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The bond of peace. This is why it's important that what we say about ourselves is important because it's not centered on us. It's not like we get to say, well, we are special. We don't, we don't do that. Because you know what? Our bond, and, and, and even in this word, I love this, this word can be translated fetter or fastener. The fastener, look how it sounds, the fastener that is our peace. That we look at each other and we say, we know the glue that keeps us together. We know it. We know the bond that has that has that has binded us together, heart to heart. Why? Because this peace has its origin in God. It's the peace from God, the peace of God, and the peace through God. Chapter 1, 2, and 3. The peace that is found in Jesus Christ alone. Peace. It can also be translated harmony. To be harmonious together with one another because we are at peace with God first and foremost. We're no longer enemies of God. I mean, we remember this. We're not even that far from it. Chapter 2, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. You were lost. Verse 14, chapter 2, For he himself is our peace. He himself is our peace. Peace is a person. Verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh, that's Jesus, the enmity. The enmity meaning you're, you were an enemy. It had condemned you. Verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were far, or far away and peace to those who were near. This, this peace, listen, this peace came down from heaven. And then he did what was impossible among us. Among ourselves, it was impossible, but God, with God, no, nothing is impossible, right? This is, this is Paul and what he says even in, in Colossians chapter 3. We could turn there. Colossians 3. 
verse 15. It says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. We have a gratitude. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 says this, Now many, that, that now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. This is God's goal. The God of peace, he calls himself. And James says that this, that this, this peace is the nature of God. And it's the nature of God in, 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 that is embedded in God's people because you are truly the ones that have experienced true peace. I, I love what it says in James 3.18. Listen to what it says. It says, quote, it says, The seed whose fruit is righteousness, that's believers, is sown in peace by those who make peace. What is it saying? You have been embedded with peace. And then your fruit that is produced from that is peace to other people also. Some in the church, listen, some in the church um, don't produce peace but they produce strife and division. It's like second nature to them. And, and I ask, I even ask myself sometimes why, and then I think to myself, well, maybe they haven't experienced peace with God. So what they do is they envy the peace that you have. So they desire to take it away from you. So what they do is how do they respond? This while they, they lack love, they lack tolerance, they lack patience, and they lack humility. This is a real danger. If you operate in this way, you may be self-deceived. You may be, have never experienced what true peace is, a peace with God. Turn to John 14 as we close. John 14. Jesus says this. Verse 27. It says, peace I leave with you. Talking to the disciples. It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Now as the world gives, do I give to you? Then he tells them, do not let your heart be troubled. No, let it be fearful. This peace is, is not fabricated. It's not a worldly peace, Jesus said. It's just a peace that only comes from him. Later on in life, John, in, in 1 John chapter 4, John is in his 90s now. He is, he is close to, he's a spiritual grandpa to all these churches He's at the end of his life, and he, he, he writes 1 John, and listen to what he says. And the same writer of the Gospel of John says this in chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. He says this, and this is love. He says, not that we love God. That's, that's not it, John says. Child, he says, listen, this is not it. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to the, be the propitiation for our sins, the payment for our sins, the atonement for our sins. In verse 6, 17, it says it again in a different ways. It says, but, but by this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Confidence meaning you're not going to be judged. You have a peace that surpasses all understanding because you are made right with God. And, and the church, 
Listen, that hasn't changed. Why do we pursue love, tolerance, patience, humility, gentleness? Why do we pursue that? Because this is us. We have no fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Turn to one, one more place, Colossians chapter 3. And I close with this same verse last week, but I think it's, it's necessary to look at it again. Verse 14, Colossians 3. Beyond all these things, beyond everything he said, he says, put on love. Why? Because, which is, or because it is the perfect bond of unity. We've been given the greatest, listen, we've been given the greatest reason and motivation towards unity. Because he has united us in love to himself via a bloody cross. This unity is of the highest importance, of the highest degree. Thus, Paul tells us to preserve it at all costs. So I ask you, will you answer that call? So I have a few questions for you for tonight. And they're based on just one question with underlying sub questions here. It says, how will you practically, and that's the, that's the, the Q question, the, how will you practically put into practice, and then here we go, humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, love, diligence, and peace. Humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, love, and peace. Pray with me. Father, we... Thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is true. And it's living and active and it, it resides within the hearts of your people. And this evening, our desire is to respond in an honoring way to you. That we would look at how we can quickly, how we can quickly apply your word to our lives. That humility would be at the forefront of every attribute of our character. That gentleness would be how we interact. Patience would be how we love. Tolerance would be based in truth. Love would be based in the work of your son. And diligence to preserve peace would be based in the prayer of your son in John 17. And that through that we could have peace, a practical peace among each other. And in that, we will reflect the gospel work that you have accomplished. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.